You're on Radio Pacific. Our topic is Centre Point, and we're talking to Bert Potter. Do you say you're God? Do you believe you're God? You don't look like God in that yellow T-shirt. Uh, yes, of course I'm God. Well, this is what all the fuss is about. The Centre Point Religious Community at Albany near Takapuna. Being God, I have to create a universe. And I create the universe inside my own mind, from what I see, from what I observe, from the things around me. This is a story about very well-intentioned, often very intelligent, searching spiritual people who ended up in a cult environment that grew gradually over time. They gained a lot of beautiful things but they dragged their children into this. And their children did not choose any of it. Can I ask you whether or not you feel that there mightn't be a risk of promiscuousness among youngsters exposed to uh, the amount of sex at the centre point? Well, our, our children have nothing hidden from them at all. They see everything. Bert Potter was a very charismatic person who understood people's weaknesses and knew how to exploit them. He's a very dangerous person. Let's take another call. Mary, what's your view on this? Now, Bert Potter, you call yourself God. I think you're the devil. Who do you owe allegiance to? I owe allegiance to myself. Uh, I owe allegiance to God. Ah, but you see, I am God. All of whom I knew. All of whom I felt very, very comfortable with. There were children, there were adults. It didn't seem in any way like a performance. It was, it was just me giving birth at, at home. <laughs> maybe was the nearest thing I've ever had to something that felt like home. I guess a home that had all the, all the good and all the bad things that happened in homes.
I'm in it as the evil genius, am I? Well, she has been the most vocal objector and the most frequent writer of letters to newspapers. She is age 50. God, was I? That's 35 years ago. I came to live in Albany in 1976, a couple of years before Centre Point came. So I was there from their birth. 1978 New Zealand in Albany was a quiet, rural town and everybody knew everybody else and you didn't lock your house when you went out because the neighbours might need to put your washing in it after they'd taken it off the line. It was that rural idyll that we dream of. of people who have decided to set up a commune, bought some land up the road, and I hear a neighbor saying, a bunch of bloody hippies moved in. I sort of bristled inside and thought, hmm, they might be able to teach you a few things. It even crossed my mind and my husband's. We might even join them if we felt like it. I started to find that my life in Thames was a bit dull, but too safe. I think it was the predictability of life, and it felt like the next thing we'd be doing would be the overseas trip over to Fiji, and I thought, God, I don't want that. Uh, we had proceeds from a house and car, and uh, that went into the community, and I had quite a few doubts um, early on about that, you know, that I, um, this is all I had. Uh, now it seems quite a small thing, more of we have a huge, great thing here, much larger than I'd ever dreamed of. It was this heavy dream of community, of free love, community. Just learning, it's like those things all seem to me to be paths of learning how to be in the world. If you're not prepared to accept the growth and the movement that happens, then don't think about communities. Get into a nice little comfortable house in the suburb somewhere, uh, put your fences up all around it, keep the gate closed and shut yourself off. But if you move into a community, the first thing is to accept that there's going to be changes. I think Mum had told me about a kind of a utopian dream that we were going to live together and share resources and she was obviously waxing pretty lyrical about the idea. As a 13-year-old, I was a very innocent kid. It was a lovely piece of land, lovely big lawn. And we'd go up into the bush and camp. And we were just in our kid's world. We'd play music at night in the living room and kids and teenagers would dance. The adults would sit, sit around watching. Sort of do these amazing <laughs> interpretive dances. I would have liked a video of it actually, <laughs> pretty funny. There was no sense of what was to come. Centre Point had an open day. So that was my first introduction to anything to do with Bert Potter. Thought he was an unremarkable person with remarkably bright eyes. He had very piercing eyes, but he had this remarkable power over these people. I was astonished and horrified to see that if Bert Potter did this, all the centre point people did that. If he crossed his legs, if he cupped his chin, if he folded his arms, they'd all follow suit. It was like Potter with a hundred heads. It was horrifying. It really was. 
God was moving among them and I didn't like God. I'm Narian. I was a member of Centrepoint from the early days for about six years. What we wanted to do was form a community that was like a family, that we could learn to live with each other and rely on each other. Most of the people were quite talented people in whatever they were doing. Potters, there was the hat factory, dress design. It was just a lot of talented people all together. We had a dream that it would take us about four or five years to get all of the structure in place and then we could sit back and enjoy our lives. I'd been a street kid at 11 years old, living on the streets of Sydney. And I got picked up by the cops and I got put in Westbrook Farm Home for Boys. I had some very terrible things happen to me in that place. I was looking for a home, I was looking for a mentor, I was looking for somebody who could teach me about stuff. And I think that's why I went to Centre Point. Bert Potter, I was a very friendly person. And he asked me a lot of questions about my past. You always felt at ease in his company. And he was very convincing. My first impressions of Bert was the quality of his gaze, was his eyes. Somehow I got to be sitting in front of him and then we just looked at each other for a long time. I don't recall finding him an attractive man in any way at all, but his eyes were very still, very present, and at that time, completely with me. After my first introduction to Bert Potter, I didn't know really anything very much. All I knew was what I heard from people. And the first alarm bell rang when I heard that he used to run a Dale Carnegie course on how to win friends and influence people. Because one of my friends had actually been there and she said, oh, the man that I went to who ran this terrific course and I believe he, he's in charge of your commune. He'd run a firm called Boracure, a pest extermination company, and there were complaints about corrupt sales techniques. I think he was one of these people who pick up various trades and he can be a, a guru here, he can be a, a salesman there, and he splits from one thing to another and he's obviously got some talents. He'd seen that the tide of the times was for spiritual growth and experimentation. He had polished his craft at Esalen, the home of a very famous spiritual growth community in California. And he had also been to the community founded by Rajneesh in India. I lived in uh, Pune for quite a number of years. The ashram was dynamic. There were so many people there. We were all very close. It was just a beautiful time. And Bert arrived, and he struck me as quite a... Um, quite a fuckwit, really. It was 
fairly normal or compulsory sort of to do the dynamic meditation. And dynamic meditation used to happen at six o'clock in the morning, every morning. There would be hundreds of people there doing it. Yelling and screaming and jumping around. And I started hearing these stories from other people. But apparently it was saying, I'm only here to observe, and he would not participate. He just seemed to lurk in the background. And then I started meeting people there who had been in groups with Bert in Esalen when he learnt primal therapy, and he did the same thing there. He refused to participate, and people got really annoyed with him. I find working with Bert that he seemed to be sort of cooing to me, encouraging me, and that every word that he offered me, I could take and go that bit deeper. Ah, 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 ah. Bert had been to Puna and been to Esalen and was essentially saying he already had the capacity to teach what he was there thinking he might learn. The groups and the therapy was definitely the basis of the early community. If you take therapy out of centre point, then you don't have a centre point. Well, I'd probably be on the extreme radical fringe of the psychotherapeutic movement. <laughs> What does this mean in terms of the way the place runs? Do, you, do the profession give you trouble at all? Uh, no, uh, we, we get a lot of backing from many of the professional people. The, the doctors, many, many doctors send their patients along here. Do you ever worry that you might be wrong? Uh, no, I have no doubts about that at all. I was engaged when I was 17 and married when I was 18. Um, had my first child when I was 19 and second when I was 21. By the time I was in my late 20s, I really was not dealing well with the world. And my marriage fell apart. I went into another relationship immediately. Then that fell apart. And I sort of thought, well, there's a common denominator here. It seems to be moi, so I'd better go and do something about it. <laughs> Let all the thinking go. I'd heard a lot about Bert. Let all the tension go. I'd heard that he was a very able therapist. And he was expressing some deeply held beliefs of my own. Just be aware of you doing it. Aware of the feeling that comes with it. I felt quite high because really it was still a very new experience for me to be validated. I often describe it as, as blowing my little middle class kind of existence open like a bomb. We believe that you know, psychotherapy can't be just a nice thing to do. It's something that gets right down to the gut level of people. You've got to take all the nasty bits as well. <laughs> Technical names for what's happening here vary, but basically, it's a type of primal therapy. Essentially, primal therapists encourage their patients to release what they call blocked or buried energy. Usually, this is by screaming. You really did have to be brave to go to those groups. You had to be desperate or brave. However, at the time, it was all it was. They were very challenging, very in your face. Uh, for some people, I think, very damaging. My name is Dean Thomas. I was a member of the police 
for 37 years. All my service was in frontline duties. The first time I heard of Centre Point, when I was working on a late shift in the CIB office on my own, a man about 35 years of age had come into the station to report what had happened to his wife there. All right, how can I help? I'm here about my wife, OK? Uh, three months ago, she gave birth to our first child, right. a little girl. And my wife is the sweetest and most lovely woman in the world. Um, everything was great at the start, but uh, she, she developed um, some kind of depression. Uh, she, right. she just shut down. And it got so bad that I, uh, I took her to the hospital. Um, they put her in Ward 10, right. a psych ward. Um, it was there where she met two nurses who told her about a place called Centre Point, right. run by a man named Bert. And what, 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 what is Centre Point? It's a, it's a, it's a therapy centre. Right. Uh, they said that Bert was, that was kind and caring and he would help her get better, so I went along with it. Okay. Uh, it was only going to be for a week. I dropped her off on the Monday, and on the Friday when I picked her up, she, she changed. I mean, first of all, they taught us how to swear, which felt fucking fantastic. She was swearing in the car on the way home, and she never swore. She began to tell him what had happened on her encounter group and how she'd had sexual relations with a number of men, willingly, on the group. I don't know what's going on out there, but it's not right. So I need you to do something about it. Okay, okay, okay. So this this sex she was having, um, did, she, did they force her her to do it? No, they didn't force. They didn't force her to do it. Right. But it's not right. She just got out of a psych ward. So I need you to do your job and right, take a look okay, at that. All right, all right. And he was a broken man as he sat in front of me, with tears in his eyes, and that was the beginning of the inquiry. These women are community residents. They're pregnant. The nudity? At centre point, shedding your clothes is evidence of your ability to shed your inhibitions. And the feeling of letting go. Anything that was a barrier between people whether it was visible or invisible, was something to be broken down if possible. There's no doors on the toilets. You just sit out there, people are walking past, you're just sitting on the toilet. You're only allowed to use one sheet of toilet paper. That's all. Everybody had to know everything about everybody else physically and mentally and spiritually. You were stripped bare and rebuilt by Bert. A lot of people get into sex as an escape. They get into it because it becomes the thing to do. It's uh, part of a sort of a compulsion almost to have to prove themselves. But whether you do it once, twice or nine times a day or nine times a week or whatever, it's the feelings that you can have with it, the ability to let go, to be able to be totally there for the other person that's important. The sexual openness was very central to it. There was, uh, there was a belief that you could share partners. Whatever difficulties you found in that was something to be worked through with individual people, not to be avoided or, or made wrong. It, it became a thing with some of the women to have sex with Bert. You know, the leader, the chief, it was kind of a feather in your cap to have sex with Bert. All the ladies every morning, they go and hide in the bushes down near the little shack that Bert's got to wait for his wife Margie to go to work. And then there'd be this dash. be lined up. Bert positioned himself as God, so it was as if he was offering a kind of 
godlike experience. Now I'd like you to get them to pairs. And with those people who haven't got uh, ongoing partners, try to get somebody they've had some sort of a sexual relationship with over the last uh, three months or so. We were just in our kids' world, looking askance at, at the adults and the weird stuff they were doing. The weirdest thing and the most shocking thing was they started having these community overnight sessions in the lounge but everyone swapped partners so you all spent the night with someone else. I feel like there was a battle which I, I had early on with myself about wanting a normal life, wanting to be normal and yet it was so not normal, how I was living was just so not normal. I decided to go up and have a look at the centre point and talk to Bert. I thought, I'll take a shorthand typist with me. Uh, shoes off. All right. Moira was absolutely experienced, a brilliant woman. And I briefed her on what she might encounter. Detective Sergeant Dean Thomas. This is my hmm? associate Moore. Oh. He had very bright blue eyes. His eyes immediately <laughs> fell on my typist. Uh, just before you get any ideas, Mr Potter, um, I'm not here to investigate any crime. As far as I'm aware, no crime's been committed. Although uh, there have been some concerns raised by members of the members of the public about um, um, about uh, your therapy sessions. Hmm. People were wandering through, some of them completely starkers. I specified there was no criminal complaint against him. Well, a light came into his eyes, and it was like he'd been given a pulpit to preach. Well, most people come along because they have some specific problem that's bugging them, you know, something in their marriage or something. was the most important part of the interview, really, was his theory on children when they are to be introduced to sexual matters. I don't think there should be an absolute ban on sexual contact. Sexual relations uh, under the age of, say, 14, if it's treated in the right way, is probably not harmful. As I said, oh, do you practice this at the community, Bert? He very quickly answered and he said, oh, no, we obey the law here. But what I'm saying, in the future, this will be happening in our society. But the problem comes from the attitude of society. Is that right? I'm thinking the man is a sexual predator and alarm bells were just ringing in my head. My name is Ella and I moved to Centrepoint Community when I was 12 years old with my mother and two brothers. Aren't you good helping your mum? Mum was recovering from a breakdown A family member or a friend reached out to Lifeline. Hi. Hi. They suggested that we go there. Hi, welcome. Thank you. For some support. So the first time I came across Bert, we'd only been there, must have been only a couple of days. him coming up behind me said you look just like your mother and squeezed my bum I remember freezing and realising that no one had stopped him or, or we're going to stop him I felt completely alone in that moment. 
Self-styled guru and psychotherapist Bert Potter and his Centrepoint community are in trouble with the locals for allegedly preaching and publicly practicing sexual freedom. One objector, mother of five with four degrees, cites the time she and her husband went for a Sunday drive and popped into the Centrepoint nursery, which is open to the public. They had a, a big nursery and it had been advertised quite a lot and there was a big notice by the gate, so we went in and we looked around and it was very impressive and as we were leaving, while my husband was backing up the car and I was sitting there uh, just sort of admiring the receding lister, a couple of centre point adults started having sexual intercourse in front of us. It was almost like it was staged, designed to confront, designed to shock and designed to demonstrate how untouchable they were. When people came from the outside in their repressed sexual states and looked at what was going on, they became incensed because probably many of them would like to have been that open. My name is Simon and I was at Centrepoint for 11 years. In those early days, I was dealing a, a lot with the changes of finding myself in a wheelchair after having a motorbike accident. You know, I was exploring my own sexuality within my own limits. And at Centrepoint, I was able to be accepted by people to a far greater extent than I could have experienced in the, in the big wide world. Bert talked a lot about the world outside and never in a good light. It was us at Centre Point, and then there was a the big bad world outside. There was that feeling of going across the bridge and stepping into a different world. Quite quickly, a sense of us and them, and you know, out there and in here. I remember distrust coming into our thinking, and I remember, you know, joining in with that thinking. We were right, we knew the truth. Everyone else was wrong, everyone else was repressed and stuck. I'd heard that he wanted to expand and clearly he did. And they were building more and more accommodation and they were having more and more people arrive. And we didn't want more and more. It was known as the fucking farm. I mean, do you want to live in a place like that? You don't. But worst of all, the rumours that involved the sexual exploitation of very young people. Is this really a moral battle? Yes, yes. I think it is. I have heard some very unpleasant rumours of hanky-panky involving young children. There's no proof that it's true, but it rings true. And then I found myself one of a group of people attending hearings at the council chambers and organising objections to centre point applications for expansion. They were the only things that we could try and object to. Takapuna City Council has given Bert Potter and his 145 followers until midnight tomorrow to cut the number living at their Albany property to 60. Well, the next thing we knew, the battles we were having, and Centre Point became headline news right throughout New Zealand. And Bert's fame spread. The one thing we're quite convinced about is that we're going to stay together as a group. They've got to prove that we're trespassing, and we say we're not. These people are going to be thrown out of their homes tomorrow. And I'm quite angry about that. This has never happened in the history of New Zealand. You gave him oxygen, and sadly, perhaps over the years, I think we helped to strengthen Potter. We're a very law-abiding group here. We don't break the law. But we do break the law, that one regulation, which says we can't live together, we can't live on our own property, we can't congregate as a group. And whenever all those media came out, it should give him a platform to talk and do his thing. I think it's absolutely ridiculous that we should be put in this position. We've got to exist somewhere. We can't just disappear. It was like Potter was unstoppable. And you realised part of it was because you were swimming against the tide and partly because he was such a good propagandist. This is human rights. This is people. 
who have been denied a home. We've got all the facilities we need here, we've provided it. And I think that we deserve a bit of recognition for what we've done. I was demonised, publicly demonised. I had nice friends say to me, it's like the Salem witch hunts what you're trying to do. Last month, when the Takapuna City Council gave the Centre Pointers permission to move up to 224 people onto their trust land at Albany, the Secretary of the Local Residents and Ratepayers Association was... Appalled, frankly. I'm sorry, I find this quite hard times because we were defeated. It was, it was a dreadful feeling and then the hostility from the Centre Point people was, became terrifying. My youngest daughter started school at Albany. I think she'd been going for about three weeks and I used to walk her along the footpath to school holding her little hand. Honestly, it wasn't just me, it was my family. I felt that that was almost sort of the end of my opposition. It felt it sort of broke me, to be perfectly honest. I thought, I've done my best. I can do no more. If you actually want a contract to experience something deeper, then you sit on the cushion, that's all. What do you mean by something deeper? You'll know when, when you actually feel like <laughs> you, you want to look at something in a, in a deeper sense than just this trivial talking about it. You might sit in the middle of another 16 people and have them all say whatever they thought was negative about you. And they have to keep going until they can dredge up every single thing they can think of. And I also hate your vagueness, because I don't know, I don't sort of know, I know you're leaving it up to me that I have to say what I want, but it feels weird. I remember Burton saying, you're really heavy. You've got a really heavy energy. It was a judgment. I just knew it was bad. Heavy was bad. I wasn't light and free and happy. So he would issue edicts, and they were called Bert Seds. And if it was a Bert Said, you had to do it. One of the tasks Bert gave Margie, Bert's partner, she had to carry a cross. It's a big, full-size crucifix. Everywhere she went. To the toilet, to the dining room. That was not what I would call a healthy spiritual environment, put it that way. The sufferers were a group of people that Bert had labelled as enjoying their own misery. <laughs> they had to walk up from the community to his house, flagellating and wailing the whole way. If you didn't follow the task that you were given, I don't know what happened, but the psychological pressure was enormous. At one stage, my daughter was in a 
an ongoing sort of committed relationship and he, he and I ended up on a family group together. And we had a lot of pressure put on us to have sex. And I said, no way, that's my daughter's husband, basically. But the pressure that was put on me was, so you would deprive your daughter of the chance to deal with that and learn something about herself because of your own scruples. So that was, like, that was where it was just getting a bit sick. I had a few run-ins with Bert sort of at that level. He wanted me to go and work as a prostitute to earn money for the community. And I said, no way, I'm not doing that. He said, oh, so you wouldn't want to help the community. Bert, you know damn well I help the community in every way I can. That way, no, I'm quite happy to deprive the community of my help in that direction. Thank you. When I arrived, the community had been functioning for years and Bert's philosophies had, they were ingrained. Part of that was encouraging the sexuality of the kids there. If you were sexually free, you'd arrive. That was what was to attain for. So to be repressed, to be heavy, to be shy, to be reluctant was perceived as is really stuck, um, and being stuck was not good. And everyone was conditioned to that, yeah. Well, I'm relieved to have my children here where this sort of thing is open, where they can ask me questions, they can see sex if th happening if they want to. The women around Bert, they were kind of there to do his work under his direction. So one of the counsellors took us girls through a self exploration of our bodies and then kind of got off on it so she was masturbating with another woman after she demonstrated how we could explore our own bodies I was 12 then what does a 12 year old say the problem comes from the uh, attitude of society to it, and it's the attitudes of society that make the problem, not the actual events. The events, there's nothing wrong with sex. Sex is a very beautiful, very pleasant experience, or it should be. If it's not, then you need to look at yourself and say, what's wrong with me? Um, so I can't see that anything that is so fundamental and so beautiful can be harmful. Two main people to avoid, and that was Bert and Dave Mendelssohn. Dave Mendelssohn was just a creep. He had power, but he didn't have the same sort of power as Bert. But there was definitely a feeling it was definitely unspoken, but that you were a failure. It was shameful to not go off with Bert. And that was a sort of a, a rite of passage. On two occasions, I was sexually abused by Bert with him and his, and, Ma and Maggie. It was horrible. And um, it still makes me feel sick. I don't really want to talk about it. And I came to realise that Bert absolutely believed that um, young girls should be initiated by people who really knew what they were doing. And I remember I used to look at him and think, why would any young girl want to be with a pot-bellied fellow so many years older? I know Mum fiercely loved me but she did not know how to protect me. You know, she should have got me out of there. So the question comes back to the mothers. How did they think that was good? What happened to their instincts? They were brainwashed. Your centre point interviews are here. Ah, thank you. I had the centre point file sitting on the side of my desk and uh, the boys had come in, some of the uniforms started, well, how's Dirty Booty doing? And it became a, a joke. He was Dirty Booty. And I was the centre point man. Hello, Joy. Hi. Hi, my name's Detective Sergeant Thomas. Thanks for coming in. Sure. I'd just like to talk to you today, if I may, about um, why you left centre point. Can I just say that it was just so great? Sure. We had this freedom to be ourselves, but then, my grandma died and I got a large inheritance and I just didn't feel right giving the inheritance to the community. Right. 
Okay. And about how long ago was that, approximately? I'd say about eight or nine months. Right. I mean, at first it was great, you know? Real sense of family and community, but I just got this weird vibe. So I left. Right. And would you say that Bert Potter contributed to that change in the atmosphere? Uh, well, it was more that open marriage for me that was the weird change. It was the awkward sex. I mean, some of us didn't like that at all. And some of us didn't mind. Right. And how would you characterise your own feelings about Mr Potter? Well, he seems a nice chap, really. He's a great man. And they never, ever revealed any sexual offending that went on with the community. They always kept that guarded. So, concerning criminal prosecution, not a thing I could do about it. I don't remember how I felt about going there initially. I know how I felt once I was there. It didn't feel like a safe place to me. My family fell apart and the relationship end was quite a bad one. My parents weren't able to care for us. The decision was made for me to stay as a foster child with my best friend's family at Centre Point. The culture there was that the kids free ranged. All the kids were parented by all the adults at Centre Point. The community was raising me, but it left me very vulnerable. You know, I was a kid that no one was watching. Having to negotiate things that I never had to negotiate before. Mary, can bring it through? Like being seven and going, I have to catch the bus somehow to get to school? Well, what about some school lunch? Who's going to sort that for me? Getting up in the morning and having to rifle through boxes of clothes to find something to wear. Not even having my own underwear. I was just at sea in a little boat. And I was being tossed around by whatever weather system came in. There was nothing about this context that I was prepared for. Susie was a really good friend of mine. She was a really sweet girl. So we were really good buddies. Bert was wanting to have a relationship with her, along with Margie. He doesn't want to have one, he wants them both. But it's like Sue says, no, fuck you, I don't want anything to do with that. But he puts all of his energy into putting her down, into deriding her and making her feel like she's a nothing. He just made her snap. She was a nurse that worked in uh, intensive care. So she knew exactly what drugs she needed to finish herself off peacefully. And that's what she did. The uniform branch had attended and found the body of a woman in her 30s in the bush lying up against a tree. And she was living in Centre Point and she was one of Bert Potter's sexual partners. I thought it was an opportunity to speak to more people at the community. Also, I wanted to make sure that it was a suicide. Bert he said nothing about his relationship with a girl, he just said how it was a tragedy and shocking and it was all due to bondages in her life which she couldn't release. My name is Ray Van Danen. I'm a retired police officer. 
I was a detective superintendent when I retired and I did 39 and a half odd years of service with New Zealand Police. Dean Thomas, who was my detective sergeant at the time, we were working together on this. There is reported conversations between this woman and Potter that she was threatening suicide and his response was quite laissez-faire and uncaring and basically that if that's what she felt she needed to do, well, she may as well go and do it because she was um, someone who was exercising her free will. Notwithstanding the fact that she was vulnerable, she was in quite a, a bad place psychologically, I believe. I'd lost a really good friend. She'd been taken away and I blamed Bert for it, rightfully so. The adjudicating judge found it to be a suicide and it was a suicide, there was no doubt about that. And that was the closure of another episode that just brought to light more things that were happening on the community and, of course, it brought back memories to me. Jim Jones. Jonestown, Guyana was the scene of probably the most bizarre act of the century, the mass suicide of more than 900 people. All were members of the People's Temple, a way out religious group led by Jim Jones, a 47-year-old self-proclaimed messiah. They all took poison, 900 of them. 300 of them children. And they all died. And that was from the preaching of one guru. And he controlled that community completely, just like Bert was doing with his preaching. This is something that we're working toward all the time. Right? Something really has to be done about this. Totally and absolutely honest with one another. There was a lot of rhetoric outside about this, you know, a lot of fears. People were being afraid that Centre Point was going to turn out like that. But I think being inside Centre Point, we were all horrified at those thoughts. What, Bert's going to poison us? Yeah, right. I like half a chance he is. <laughs> but I don't think people realised that he was. He was poisoning them, but they didn't know it. It was around this time that my boss came down to talk to me. And this was a very rare occurrence. Dean, how's the family? Oh, very Please, good, sir. Thank take you. A seat. So, where are we at with Centre Point? Oh, we're in a good place, sir. Yeah, there's definitely something going on up there. There's no doubt about it. Definitely something. What about hard evidence? Well, well, I haven't got anything definitive yet, sir, but I'm. Okay, well, this is starting to feel a bit like a waste of police time. I'm sure a detective of your calibre would have found something by now if there was indeed something to be found. So let's shelve this. You've got other cases that require your priority, right? Yes, sir. Keep up the good work. Very good, sir. I felt invaded on a daily basis. Going into the communal outside shower and there were naked men in there and I had to be in there at the same time with them and seeing them with erections, you know, like next to me, looking at me. Because the longhouses were open and this was a very sexually oriented community, people were having sex around me all the time. And looking through windows and seeing orgies seeing things that I shouldn't have been seeing. I remember sitting right at the bottom and looking up these steps. And the steps were significant because he took me up these steps to a shed beyond the longhouses, kind of into the wilds a bit, and that's where things happened. So, you know, I knew, sitting at the bottom of these steps, what the walk up there meant. What happened with that man or men, I don't know if it was one or more, um, 
It was just kind of like the kick in the pants, you know, but I was already on the ground. I was already on the ground and then this guy came along and gave me a bit of a kick. But I was already on the ground. There was a place called the Glade and it was uh, an opening surrounded by a beautiful native bush. And I remember going there, going through deep into the trees. Someone told me that someone had killed themselves there, a woman. I remember going there and speaking to her. I had this melancholy that was so deep and I withdrew into it. It's just really abnormal for a child. It's really abnormal for a child to have such intense, profoundly negative emotions. The file was in my bottom drawer and I received a phone call from Kerry Witchell. He said, I can lay open everything that is happening there. Kerry Witchell was a foundation member of Centrepoint. He alleged that adults at Centrepoint were involved in sexual activities with children in the broadest possible sense. I took a statement. It went on forever. It named all the people who were committing sexual offending against people as young as two and three years of age. And the people who were offending against them. What you're saying basically is that there was sexual activity, sexual intercourse between children and adults that was condoned at Centre Point? Yes, yes, very definitely. Mm -hmm. This was the breakthrough I'd been trying to obtain on this inquiry all those years. I had a squadron assembled with all the part files all ready to go. I was preparing to go up to Centre Point to conduct interviews based on Kerry Witchell's statement. And I get a phone call. Yeah, right. Yeah, I'll come now. Hey, Ray. Yeah? Boss wants to see us. Did you bring white gloves? <laughs> Cheeky bastard. <laughs> we were both summoned one particular morning, which was a rare occurrence. Gentlemen. Well, I'm sure that introductions will not be necessary. I've just been offering Mr. Potter a full and frank apology on your behalf, Jindana, for what I can only describe as a campaign of intimidation and harassment. Mr. Potter is an upstanding member of this community who is offering help and sanctuary to some of this community's most vulnerable. So as such, I'm now removing you from this case. He was almost apologetic that the police would in fact be looking at Potter and his associates. It was all very, very strange. Any further interviews that take place on Mr. Potter's property, at his residence, he will have every right to attend. I was banned from going to the community because they believed we were compromised 
on the inquiry. A team come from Auckland Central. Guys who knew basically nothing about the inquiry, certainly they had my part piles and all this, and Kerry's statement, but they didn't have the background knowledge. A full police inquiry was conducted into Kerry Whittle's allegations, but the matter was dropped because of insufficient evidence. Bert Potter maintains that Kerry Whittle's allegations were the workings of a sick mind. Mr Whittle made 11 statements of a criminal nature and they have all been investigated by the police and the police have found nothing to substantiate them at all. They knew all about that the cops were going to come. They menaced and running around making sure that the cops were not going to be able to talk to the kids. There was always going to be an adult or a person there, but they're going to control it and they're going to make sure that nothing comes out. Nothing comes out. No one talks. Bert was present and they were simply stonewalled and nobody said anything and they were back within a very short time. I certainly would not allow the children to be uh, interviewed because uh, if I do, then they're picking up the, the idea that there's something wrong in what they're doing. Uh, it puts the police in a bad light with them, and we, we've got a lot of respect for the police. And we don't believe that they should be interfering in moral issues where there is absolutely no proof of anything happening. If my boss had not been influenced by Bert Potter, I would have gone up with the team the following week from Takapuna who would have known the inquiry inside out. Now, I may have come up against the same result, I may have been stonewalled, but I would have at least had a, a better opportunity. But that was stopped right there. I did nothing more on centre point. I mean, we started off with what, 60 people or something in there. This is at a point where there are 300 Centre Point has got no direction anymore. It's just falling to pieces, you know. There's, there's all sorts of things happening that aren't quite right. And I just knew at that point, that's it, I'm going to leave CP. And I stepped over the fence, wanting to get out of the CP property. And as I did that action of stepping over the fence, I felt some physical feeling inside as if something had snapped. This is the end, this is all, I'm finished. This is me, I'm getting out. Most police files after seven years are destroyed. And I knew that at some stage, the young people who had been sexually offended against would grow into teenagers and adults and they would have issues. So I took a copy of the file and I took it home with me when I retired. Years later, in the mid nineties, I was advised by an old colleague of mine who was still in the CIB that my old boss, who had shut down the Centrepoint inquiry, had been convicted himself on child abuse charges. It was a shock to me that somebody in a position of such authority running a police force that is meant to solve crime could stand in the way of solving crime. So I could have stopped another seven years of abuse. And that was, to me, the tragedy of Centrepoint. I began to realise that there was a group of people who, for one reason or another, were intent on developing drugs and then thinking, no, I've got to go. I, this, is, this is not, this is no longer the way I want to live. There were no drugs at Centre Point in the early days. They even took coffee off the menu for a while um, because it had caffeine in it. I think the real reason was that Bert didn't drink it. 
and then the next thing um, Bert was introducing um, uh, drugs in, into, into, into the community. That was being done, done therapeutically. I think I was pretty interested and pretty excited about, about, about that. I, didn't, I don't recall ever challenging any of what was happening, just kind of observing it and thinking, oh, I'm out of here, which is really, a, you know, it, it's not a passion I'm proud of. It's, it's a passion that I carried on for quite some years after that as well. If I didn't like something, I left it, rather than dealing with it. The first time that the, the, the drugs were introduced to the community, all the adults, we had ecstasy and That was the most incredible experience and one of the most momentous occasions in my life. It got me down into the core where I felt my loving. And I just got so much strength from that. I don't think there were any rules. There was certainly open sexuality there. Why would one wear clothes? For me, they were very, very rich memories of interactions with specific people. Of hallucinating and for me trying to work out what the particular hallucination might mean. And then there was this extraordinary dancing remember a lot of opera and of listening to it as if you were completely and utterly within it. They were extraordinary experiences. It was a feeling of just turning inwards and seeing yourself inside out. I wasn't scared because I didn't know what was coming. I was kind of a bit excited, I think. I felt privileged. We were kind of made to feel privileged. We were taken up to the glade and given what I understood to be was ecstasy. I was only 13. It came on very quickly and it was very, very strong. Everything became very bright and very crisp. And my hearing was very, very acute. physically capable of getting up and 
moving away. I know that what happened to me was sexual and I know there was more than one person and lots of people watching. I don't know exactly what it was that happened. The drugs were so strong. I just have the memory of lying down and seeing faces between my legs and above me and knowing that this isn't right but I actually can't move. Went back to my room and just tried to get through. The taking of drugs in groups was mostly about taking LSD in a group and it was certainly there to devise the groups. So, you know, a list would go on the board as to who would be going to his house up the hill. With the LSD, he seemed, he seemed to be. I had spent time as a uniform sergeant and then I was promoted into the Auckland Drug Squad as a detective sergeant. My team and I started picking up information from out of centre point. We were starting to hear rumours that ketamine, LSD and MDMA were being manufactured at the community itself. We were well aware that they had fairly tight security. They were very careful as to who they spoke to, what was let out, and the community members themselves were very reluctant to speak to the authorities about uh, what has all had been happening. I just had very little to do with Centrepoint at all. It just faded into the background for me. And one day the cops called me up and they wanted to, me to meet them in secrecy. 
down by the bridge. It was like something out of a Hollywood movie. I sit in my car and a cop knocks on my door, sits in the car with me, tells me all that he knows about Santa Point. It's shocking what they're telling me. Young children were given drugs and they were being forced to have sex with older people, that people were being raped out there. And I'm saying, hey, if this is true, we've got to do something, don't we? And they're saying, yes, yes, that's why you're here. We want you to help us. I go out to the community, ask where Bert is, and they tell me he's up at the Gills Road house and they're having a family meeting up there. I walked into that room amongst all of those naked people and they're all off their face on ecstasy and acid. They've all got these weird looks on their faces. Uh, eyes breaking out into a cold sweat. They all look like smiling skulls. I was thinking, oh, God, they know what I'm here for. There's Bert sitting naked in his peacock chair with Margie at his feet. Hey, Bert. Marion. I can see his eyeballs, his pupils, they're just covering his whole eye. They're all black. There's no other part of it, like, and so I know it's really off his face. Neil. Even though I'm on a mission and I promised myself I'd do whatever it takes, I couldn't bring myself to kneel in front of him. Well, I was wondering if I might just be able to get some of those pills, actually. And he turns around to somebody behind him and says, get him some pills and make sure you get the money off him. I'm supposed to, I think, go back out into the room, but I don't. And I get the hell out of that place. And I take the pills back and give it to the police and they're just ecstatic, you know, they're patting me on the back and saying what a wonderful man I am and what a great thing I've done and all of that sort of shit and I just feel like shit you know I feel like I've just done something that goes against my grain that I've dobbed in on some of my friends I'm a low life you know where I come from you don't do that sort of thing you do not there were what sounded like lots of helicopters in the sky I could hear people running across the wooden bridge outside my bedroom. I could hear a dog barking. And a torch shone on my face. What the hell? Okay, girls, don't be scared, don't be frightened. I want you to stay where you are. I want you to get dressed, stay where you are. Girls, stay here. Stay here. Stay there, stay there. You're safe, but you need to stay where you are. Go on. Check the kitchen. Oh, 
I check the office. You with me? Come on. Hey. This is a search. This is a search. Stay where you are. Right. Your dad's right. It's just a game. Your dad's right. Look after the kid. Come in. Search the bathroom. Hey, stay where you are. Go back to your room. You're safe. You're safe. Go back to your room. Go back to your room. Okay? Go back. Where's Potter? He's up at his house. All right, get in the car. You're coming with us. <laughs> we all know why we're here. We all know what we're doing. Stay focused. Stay calm. Keep on Mistakes. All right, we get in there, we get the job done, and we all go home. Let's I'm go. Police. Mr. Potter, we have a warrant to search the premises for illegal narcotics. Potter and his wife were in the kitchen at the time, and the drugs were just stored in a cupboard amongst the crockery and cutlery. No real attempt to hide them. Sir. When the cupboards were being searched, he started to get quite angry and agitated and became almost abusive. You're not breaking any law. Sit down and shut up. And you could just see the wind being taken out of the sails. I don't think anyone had spoken to him like that for a very, very long time. And then I think he realised the, the enormity of the position that he was in. It's like being in Vietnam. When we got outside, all the people were gathering around. I think we were a bit bewildered as to what it was all about. It was surreal. And I remember thinking, what are they here for? I didn't even relate it back to drugs or anything that had happened to me. It was terrifying, that outside world coming down like a ton of bricks from above to, to smash the home. Yeah. The Network News at 6 with Richard Long and Judy Bailey. Two prominent members of the Centrepoint community near Auckland appeared in court this afternoon charged with serious drug offences. When over 100 police and customs hit Centrepoint at dawn, they found drugs valued at $23,000, 600 LSD tabs, hash and cannabis. Over the last two weeks, the High Court's heard how Potter allegedly twice supplied ecstasy to adults and teenagers at Centrepoint gatherings. But Potter's lawyers claimed he'd been set up by former Centrepoint members with a grudge against him. The jury found 64-year-old Bert Potter guilty on two counts of possessing ecstasy for supply and one charge of possessing LSD for supply. He's a good man. He shouldn't be in jail. It's a bit of a disappointment to lose Bert. It's like the parable of um, when you pull out the weed, sometimes you pull out the wheat. I don't know 
know if it was Bert or somebody on Bert's behalf that asked for people who would testify for him in court. I can imagine that I might have rationalised things to myself. Still a sense of out there bad, in here good. So for me it was really important to be trying to save the dream as a whole. We were finally able to speak to the adults and the children at Tender Point without his interference. It was a lot more serious and a lot more harmful than what we initially suspected or were told about. The community just exploded and it was just exposed so rapidly, everything was... There's just so much that had been going on, it was it, it just horrifying. And the, you know, the teenagers had been They'd been really struggling, and we hadn't even seen it. It was there to see. 19 of 21 Centre Point community members arrested on drugs and sex charges are tonight free on bail. The arrests were the result of a year-long investigation by the police sexual abuse team and the drug squad. You are the one who can change the world. You are the one. Potter is already in jail on drug offences. Now he's facing sex charges. That interview I had with Bert Potter, that my right hand lady <laughs> faithfully shorthanded. I was able to stand up and give verbal evidence of that interview against Bert Potter in a criminal trial. And when I left the box and walked to the back of the courtroom, he never looked me in the eye. It was like all of the pigeons coming home to roost at once. Hmm. Um, it gave me a whole different perspective, really. I sort of had this picture in my mind that, a sec that sexual abuse was about overt power and control and, and cruelty and nastiness, and I didn't see that very nice, kind, caring people could also be sexually abusive and feeling guilty because I'd let it happen. And Kim Webby is outside the High Court now. Kim, what were the verdicts? Well, the verdict was that Bert Potter has been found guilty on the 13 counts of indecent assault that he faced. Bert Potter was jailed for seven and a half years on 13 counts of indecent assault on children. It was hard not to feel I told you so. But at the same time, you felt it had come too late. He's not going to save those children. Those damaged children. I said, no, I'm not going to place judges, but that I'd make a statement. And it was the first time I realised that I'd been abused. It was really shocking. Mm. And it's taken me a very long time to be able to say that I was abused. Yeah, I was very ashamed for a long time. There is an enormous amount of shame attached with having lived there and for having the things that had
be a book. It was just, I started writing notes, really, um, when I was in my 20s, early 20s. And I, it was really just a way of getting the, the memories out, making sense of them. It was hugely healing for me. You've written your story, close the book, on the bookshelf. It's still there, it's not going away, but you don't have to deal with it anymore. Mm. It was like there was a black hole in my memory. There was, you know, primary school and there was stuff that happened in my family and then there was all this like black hole, I won't go there, you know, I'm not going to think about that because it will draw me in and it will take me down. Then my oldest child turned seven and I spent the whole year looking at this innocent creature. Could he make his own lunch? Could he get himself to school? How would he cope with a predator? Truth heals. And there's a lot of healing that's still to be done, and only truth can heal that. It's pretty easy to blame Bert for everything. Um, but I, th I think we all have to take some responsibility. Even though we might not have known those things were happening, it was in, a, in an environment that, that we created. It was heaven and hell. It all ended in hell. Just working my way back to heaven. Yeah. I think ICCP is what it was, you know, a failed experiment that was taken over by a shitbag of a guy who called himself a guru and thought he had a touch of God. Bird Potter is live with me in the studio. Convicted of sex with underage girls and you say you're not sorry. Well, the, the, the thing is that everybody wants to make everybody guilty these days. I, I don't feel guilt. I have no, no strong feelings of guilt. I don't blame people for things. You know, it's just part of living. No guilt? No guilt at all. Unrepentant. People are going to have a problem with that. Well, that's their problem, not mine. These girls were children. Are so you not going to say you're sorry to them? I'd say I'm sorry for them, yes. I am sorry for them. To them? Forget about me. Get rid of Bert Potter. Get on with their lives. Do what they, they want to do without me. Because I don't want to have any part in it. Because you hang around in their minds. <laughs> There's nothing I can do about what happens in people's minds. People's minds are very funny, are very funny things. Heidi says you were wrong. The women are saying you were wrong. Why can't you accept you might have been? The last time I saw Bert was in the Albany village. And what I most remember is the clarity still of his eyes. There was something still attractive about his eyes. And then all the rest was an old man who looked like he might be lonely. But he certainly didn't look like a guru. Um, but then I think he'd lost guru status for me a long time before that. <laughs> 